guys and welcome back to the study tube project for those of you who don't know who i am my name is astrid i'm a youtuber and i'm currently a third year doing english literature at the university of cambridge and then in september i am starting the law conversion course during my time at cambridge i've been really interested in the renaissance period in particular the emergence of the book as we know it today so I'm going to be telling you a bit about early modern books in today's video, so please carry on watching. Early modern books were really ornate, beautiful things. Paper was really expensive, so when you got a book you made it beautiful. For example, these ones have really beautiful fabric covers. So when you bought your book, you'd buy all the paper and it wouldn't necessarily be bound yet, so it wouldn't necessarily have a cover. So what you'd do is you'd go get your book bound. So these are really beautiful embroidered book bindings. So if you're wealthy, one way you could show you're wealthy is by having embroidered book covers. And Queen Elizabeth I had embroidered book covers herself. She loved them. And then the other thing that you see in early modern books is really beautiful presentation. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how we got from manuscripts to the early modern book through the invention of early modern printing and the printing press so please carry on watching in 1440 in germany johannes gutenberg invented the printing press which sparked this printing revolution in europe and england he wasn't the first person to start printing per se um woodblock printing in East Asia had been prevalent since China's Tang Dynasty in the 8th century. Well, the thing with woodblock printing is that you can only print what you carve. So what Gutenberg really did that was important wasn't necessarily the printing press, but was the way he invented something called movable type. But before we get into movable type, let's get back to the printing basics. So before printing, texts were circulated in manuscript form like these. And you'd basically have to make handmade copies of texts when you wanted them. So it was really expensive, it was really labour intensive, and you couldn't be certain that what you were getting was the same as the next person. So you had little things called errata, which were mistakes, because perhaps one scribe had misread another scribe. So you couldn't be certain that everything was uniform and everyone was getting the same thing. These early modern manuscripts are absolutely beautiful and you can find lots on the British Library website if you want to have a little look through. This was obviously a really, really slow process and made texts pretty inaccessible for the majority of people. In this manuscript culture, authors would write dedications to wealthy patrons. So at the start of your text, you would write a little dedication to, say, the local royal person and you'd write a little poem praising them and you'd present them with your manuscript in the hope that you would get some money back and that was how early modern writers made their money but this sort of started changing this manuscript culture was sort of got rid of slowly because of the invention of printing there are two main types of printing that i want to talk about I'm probably going to butcher these when I pronounce them, so I'll put the words up on the screen as well. The first type is intaglio printing. So this was often done with plates of copper, though now you can use all kinds of materials like acetate and plastics and metals. Um, this is what lots of people might know as etching. It's where you take away layers of the material. So the areas you take away are the bits that you want to come out dark. So when you apply the ink, you apply the ink to your plate where you've scratched away your image and then you rub off the ink from the surface. This just leaves ink in the grooves of the copper plate. So then when it's printed, it's put through a press that rolls forward and it squeezes the ink out of those gaps. So the areas that you have scratched away print dark. The second type of printing is relief printing. This is done on wood or with metal. This is where ink is applied to a raised surface. So the raised area is what prints as dark. So it's kind of the opposite 
of intaglio printing. Basically, both methods were common when the printing press first started. Pictures would be done intaglio, so you'd scratch away your pretty title page, and text was done in relief. But obviously these two methods can't be printed at the same time, because one of them requires loads of pressure to squeeze ink out of gaps, whereas the other requires lighter pressure to just touch the paper onto the raised ink surface. So let's talk about Shakespeare's first folio. This was the first printed completed works of Shakespeare and this is what its title page looked like. Now as you can see it has descriptions, it has the title and then it also has a portrait of Shakespeare himself. This title page is really interesting because it combines both intaglio and relief printing. So Shakespeare's face would have been done in intaglio and the title page is done in relief. So what would have happened is that they would have printed one first, maybe let's say for the sake of argument, the text first. The page would have gone through the printing press once just to produce the text, would have been put through a second printing press a second time once the first layer was dry and Shakespeare's face would be added to it. And because it's been through the press two times, if you look at various different front pages from Shakespeare's first folio, the text is always in the same place, but sometimes the picture of Shakespeare's face moves, so it might be a little bit more to the left or a little bit more to the right, because the copper plate had not been put in exactly the same place each time, which I think is really cool. I'm a bit of a nerd, and inconsistencies in printing is really exciting to me, but we move. Before the invention of movable type, these methods were both used, but movable type really changed the game. Imagine you have like a block of wood and you want to carve a Shakespeare sonnet into it so that you can print that Shakespeare sonnet. So you get your piece of wood and you carve away so that the letters are raised and you ink it and then print it. Say you've printed 100 copies of that sonnet, which is a correct number that you need. You're now just left with this block that you can't really do anything with because it's got that Shakespeare sonnet scratched into it and you can't really use it for anything other than that Shakespeare sonnet. This is where Gutenberg's most ingenious invention takes centre stage and that is movable type. <music> movable type is letters made individually that can be assembled and reassembled to make pages of type. So you can assemble a page of type, print it a hundred times, and then take the letters apart again and reuse them. So he invented this mold where you basically pour metal in and you sort of shake it around. It fills in the spaces, the metal expands, and you're given, you know, lots and lots of little pieces of type. I took a printing class at my university and the like footage you see is from that printing class. Basically the reason this was so successful in Europe is because that European languages use a small number of characters. So there are, what, 25 letters in our alphabet and 10 pieces of common punctuation and 10 digits for numbers. So you wouldn't need to make masses and masses of different pieces of type, say if you had 100 characters in your alphabet. Type pieces were made in various fonts and sizes. The sizes were called points or PT for short, which you still see today on Microsoft Word and that kind of thing. There were two main types of font in the early modern period, black letter and Roman type. For us, these fonts are quite hard to read, but for early modern readers, these fonts were great because they looked a bit like handwriting. So they looked like scribes had written them out which is what they were used to reading. So whilst it looks hard for us, it would have been more easy for them to read it because they were used to seeing stuff that looked like handwriting. This font type is called Antica and is a Roman typeface. This is black letter. Roman typefaces like Antica uh, were used a lot during the 15th and 16th centuries and letters were designed to flow and strokes connected together in like a continuous pattern when I set type with the university, our type didn't join up, but it is still a form of Roman type. So now that we have our pieces of type, what do we do with them? Type pieces were stored letter by letter in cases. The upper case was home to all of the capital letters. The lower case 
to all the lowercase letters. So yeah, these are more names that we use in everyday language that have been taken from printing and the print house. Type was set out in close to alphabetical order. It was shifted around slightly and some of the boxes were bigger than the others depending on how frequent a letter is in the English language. So for example, your cases would have a bigger space for E's than say Z's. Pieces of type were added one by one onto something called a compositor's stick which could be held in one hand as the other hand put the letters in. When printed, whatever on the compositing stick would appear in mirror image on the page so the letters were flipped. So in the case, the letters are all back to front. A P looks like a Q, a Q looks like a P. So you have to be really careful and that's where we get the expression mind your P's and Q's from. At the end of the day, a compositor working in a print house would have all the type they had set in one long line and the owner of the print shop would come along with a ruler, measure how many lines of type the compositor had set during that day and the compositor would get paid on how many lines of type he had set. If you were setting type in a smaller font, you'd get paid more per inch. So obviously it's really important to be fast because if you're fast, you get paid more. There are records from a printing house where compositors could set 1,000 pieces of type in an hour. This is crazy fast. The pieces of type were designed to help with speedy like assemblage and they had a little groove along the top so that once you'd set a whole line of type, you could run your finger along the line of type through the groove and if your finger got stuck because there was no groove, it meant that you'd set a piece of type upside down. Pieces of type had to fit really tightly up against either side of the compositor's stick so that when you moved the type around, it wouldn't fall out. So once you set a line of type, you'd see if there were any empty spaces, any room for moving. If the pieces of type were too loose, you'd add more blank spaces in. So make the gap between words slightly bigger. And this is called justification. So after you set a line of type, you'd have to justify it so that it fit really tightly in the compositor stick. And if you go on Word now, there is a justify button. It's the one that makes the beginning and the ends of your lines all join up at the side. So that also comes from typesetting. So basically, once you have all your type set out, you'd put it into one long galley. So this was just a really long funnel where you'd put all the type out. This would be inked and printed and the printed document was called a proof and was checked for errors by a proofreader. So that's another word we get from the printing house and type. So the proofreader would go through and mark up any errors and then the typesetters would go back and change all the errors they had made. It was only once this had been done that the text would be divided into pages because if a typesetter had forgotten a word, you'd obviously have to put that word in and that would have a knock-on effect and move all of the lines that follow along a little bit, which would be an absolute nightmare to redo. But you obviously don't want to have it already laid out in pages because if a word hangs over the end of the page and has to go onto the next page, it's much easier to sort it out when all of the text is in one long line than set out in like 20 different pages. I now want to talk about something really cool um, and that's the ornaments that they used in early modern printing and these are called printer's flowers. I'll put some examples on the screen now. They're really really beautiful, really ornate and something that we obviously don't see in books anymore. They were large elaborate patterns and were made from lining up lots of small pieces of floral type. They would be used as borders and a bit like the letters that make the words, these flowers were made of tiny little metal pieces as well. So there's obviously lots of interesting discussion about how printed words might be a bit like printed flowers because they're made in the same way in the early modern period by lining up lots and lots of little pieces. These were both used as decorations and as reading aids. So for example, books of sonnets might have floral borders at the beginning and end of each sonnet to like clearly mark it off from the next one. Some flowers would have been made from woodcuts like these book covers um, because obviously they're more ornate, more twirly and not a repeated pattern. But repeated patterns would be made from metal pieces of type. And sometimes decorations would even be made from more conventional pieces of type, like this little glyph here. This group of stars in the middle is called an asterism and would have been made by getting asterisk pieces of type and like 
alternating which way up they were put in the compositor stick. So you'd put one the right way up, flip the next one, the next one the right way up, and then the brackets would have been added as well. There was only one bracket piece of type, so to do closed brackets, you'd have a bracket at the start and then flip it for the bracket at the end. I just think that's really cool. So you could have printed flowers and decorations made from type, both used as decoration and reading aids. I hope you found that video interesting. If you've got any questions about printing, leave them below. I'll try and answer them. And I'll leave some reading suggestions and links down in the description box. Thank you for watching that video and see you all soon. Bye.